Welcome back, accomplices. I'm Linda Norman. I'm a watercolor artist in Kelowna, British Columbia. Today in the studio, we're going to take another look at doing uh, birch trees, the ever popular birch trees. Uh, the process that I like to use using masking tape as a resist rather than masking fluid. And um, this time we have, uh, have uh, a little bit of uh, an advantage because we have an overhead camera. So you'll be able to see exactly where, where things are happening in, in front of you. Uh, the process is quick and simple. We're going to use masking tape as a resist rather than masking fluid and lots of luscious and rich, beautiful Daniel Smith watercolors. So as always, I make sure that my palette is nice and wet and juicy. This, by the way, is the uh, Eco Palette. It's a bamboo Eco Palette from Watercolor Online. It's Michael Solovyev's studio. You can find the link uh, to that in, uh, in the description below. I'm going to tape my page down just to keep it from buckling under the water that we're going to be using. Do a quick, just a quick application of tape oops, on the sides. I like this black solo tape. Again, this is from the Michael Solovyev Studios. You can find that through the same link at, at, in the description. I like the black. It gives me that sense of, of already having a mat on my painting. Um, I like to think about the composition of where my trees are going to be. And I take pieces of tape, and you can use any kind of masking tape really. Uh, if you find the tape that you're using is too sticky, you can put it on a surface and lift it. It takes some of the tack off. You can put it on, your, on, on, your, uh, on the leg of your pants, on your tablecloth, whatever uh, is handy. And then I start by making strips with the watercolor. And I, I try to remember to put the, the wider end of the strip, because that often is, is where it is, uh, at the bottom, because that's where the wider part of the trees are going to be. And to find balance, I think I'm just going to start with one right here. Now you'll notice that one side of the tape is, is very straight, because that's how it came off the roll. So I can make that a little more rugged by adding, tipping the tape, the tape over and just laying it alongside and that will give me a rougher edge on both sides of the tree. And if I think that that's a bit too, too thick at the top, I can change that. So there you have a beautiful, lovely, strong birch tree happening. They sometimes have little, little bits of um, smaller branches and things coming off the bottom. Compositionally, you're going to want to keep your trees uh, off balance in, in some respects. You don't want to have two and two, um, so it's, it's nice to have an uneven number, uneven sizes. and. Uh, And with these, if you rip them uh, fairly thin, you can bend them. I don't worry too much that I, you know, am getting these. Oops, put um, put down too solidly on the page either, because uh, what we're going to be doing is going to uh, going to allow us to just make those edges. Uh, a little organic looking as well. So I've just ripped this, the straight edge off of this piece and I'm going to put these a little bit, this one up a little higher. So maybe we'll have a little embankment coming down here. Um, I love to just sort of compose as I go. Don't give a lot of forethought. Um, I guess what I what I do do is observe a lot in nature and, and watch what um, what happens uh, when something strikes my fancy? Why do I like that? What is the composition? Where are things situated? And why does that appeal to me? And then I transpose that into what I do on my page. And nature, as I've said before, is perfectly imperfect. So uh, 
there are so many variables, things that you can do. Um, be creative with your trees. These little pieces want to keep coming off this way, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to add this one on. This piece was kind of chopped off at the end, and then I know that does happen in nature sometimes too. They break off abruptly, but I'm just going to uh, add a piece that came off kind of uh, thin at one end, and let that be a part of that tree. And we'll let this one come up there. And I think we'll make We will make another, this one has a flat side to it that I want to get rid of and I'm just going to see if I can't pull that off. Sometimes the tape has other things in mind. Um, it's kind of the randomness that, that I appreciate sometimes. And let's, we'll make this tree rather um, rather thick. Actually, you know what? I think I want the thicker tree on the back part. And some of these random wiggly edged pieces I can just lay on here and there just to give that, um, that appearance of a, uh, an uneven edge. And that one's too thin. We'll try a thinner one or a thicker one. There. And this is probably as far as we'll go with this. I think I think I kind of like the way it's uh, lining up. I'm just going to make it a little bit um, more pointed here. Like I say, it doesn't matter if the paint goes underneath it at some point. Um, it's all going to be um, covered over with other colors as we go. The finer branches can be added later with, um, with a fine liner. This is a beautiful liner pens or pen paintbrush again from Michael Solovia's watercolor online studio it's called a, a liner a solo liner and uh, that's incredibly beautiful for making your fine finer uh, branches as you go along I like to start with the sky and to wet my page I'm using again another brush from Watercolor Online. I love these. I love the hake or hake brushes. I've mentioned before the difference is, um, although they both hold an incredible amount of water, the difference is the hake or the hake brush has a lot of real estate on the end, so you can get a lot more coverage that way. The um, solo brushes will come to a very, very fine chisel point so you can get in and make some lines. Um, but they're both really effective for adding, adding water to your surface. So I like to start with my sky as my first layer under painting. And I'm using, I don't know if you can see it, it's very faint, but I'm using water that I've been dipping my brush and cleaning it in. Uh, maybe you can see it this way if I spatter it. Yeah, you can see. So it's got a bit of color to it. I'm okay with that. That's just fine. Some people wet the back of their page a few times and then set it onto the surface and tape it down. Um, that keeps your paint or your your paper rather wet for a longer time. Uh, as I say, I'm I'm a pretty uh, impatient and fast painter. 
I've had to develop that style with a busy, busy life going on. It's sometimes uh, not an option to spend a lot of time in the studio or painting. I love to have a bit of lightness coming through. And the color I prefer to do that with is quinacridone gold. And I will just barely, with a fairly wet brush, lay some of that in and maybe my light source is sort of coming from this direction so I will bring a tiny bit of that in and, and bring it down. We can end that uh, wherever we wish further on once we add another layer of color. So I love that that's got a bit of um, a bit of lightness and, and beauty to it. Uh, sometimes it's nice to add a little bit of a, a pink or a, or a deeper orange or even a purple. Um, here's a quinacridone rose. Let's let's try just a just a hint of that. And I'm going to take my wet brush with my quinacridone gold on it and just kind of bring that through slightly. I just want a real light little bit of a of a sunset. I think sunsets are more often likely to be pink. And then in the background our sky will be the Mayan blue that I adore. And it's a very um, dark, kind of a gray blue, but I find it to be quite, uh, quite lovely. Some of the other blues, uh, the one I keep touching in on here is the Endanthrone blue, and it's a brighter blue, something that, um, as you get to know me, you'll know that, that I, I tend to shy away from the brighter colors. I like the deeper, more subtle tones. And so I'm just bringing this color in from both sides and darker in places because that will allow me for shadows with my, with my clouds. A little bit light in there, showing that coming through. And I love the darkness as it, as, as it um, settles in, it gives you that lovely, rich um, shadow that you can put into your, into your cloudscapes. Now you saw that I kind of scooped there. I, I prefer not to have wavy lines when I'm doing my landscapes. I like to keep things mostly level with the horizon and then add my shapes later. So I'm going to put a bit of blue down here as well, just to anchor the, the painting. Now you can see up above where the light is coming through. We've got a bit of, um, oh, my painting, or my paper seems to have a flaw in it. I think it's a, I think it's a random, a random dog hair possibly. <laughs> I don't. We'll take a look at that. See if I can get that out of there. Okay, there we go. We'll cover that with um, with some rocks and some shrubbery in a few minutes. So, I know the paper towels on the microphone sound really crunchy, but they're not. They're a lovely soft uh, paper towel, but I do like to uh, scrunch them, give them a little bit of texture. You can see a bit of crinkling, wrinkling. And then I round them just slightly because I don't really want harsh edges on my clouds. And then I go in and just use this as, um, as a tool for shaping some of the clouds that maybe are coming through. Soften some of those edges. Someone had asked uh, in one of the comments recently about uh, blooms and, and how I avoid that. You can avoid that by um, keeping your paints um, consistent. If, you're, if your painting is almost dry and you're going to add a lot of water to it with another application of paint, that paint is going to want to push itself out until it can't move any further. And so that's where you'll get those, those edges on it. Um, if you are aware, and sometimes it just means having eyes on everything that's happening, 
then um, you can avoid those. If you happen to see a bloom happening, and it does happen uh, often, we just sort of lose track of where things are headed, especially when there's a lot of water if we're painting wet on wet. Um, you can go in and, and soften those edges before they've dried if you can catch it. And uh, this paper towel has a, a lot of the blue on it. I'm just with a very light touch going to feather the rest of it across. Just to bring that subtle blue color. I'm barely, barely touching. I'm just letting the edge of the paper towel sort of drag that through. And because it's still damp, those edges there will soften and diffuse a little bit. And I'm going to roll it and get a cleaner spot and just pick out a few more um, larger pieces there. Now the paint sometimes will show up in, in little droplets and pigments. I'm just going to bring the blue across that so that it's not so evident. And uh, that, I think, will be it for the sky for the time being. And I'm cleaning my brush and I'm drying it off as much as I can, taking as much moisture out as possible. And if I see any other areas, for example, where I think there may be a little excess water or maybe a bloom about to happen, I can just go in and with a feather light touch, just encourage those pigments and that water to go where, where I think I'd like them to go. And this is entirely up to you where you, where, you know, decide to help those things happen. Okay. So keeping in mind the rule of thirds, we're probably about two thirds here. So this is, this is about where my landfall is going to to come up in this embankment here. And then this one we can keep it lower and we could turn this perhaps into a lake in the background. I can see where this, this could be encouraged to be a, a mountain area. And then we'll put a shoreline in here and we'll have a little bit of, um, a, little bit of a, a line across there where your horizon would be. And then the reflection showing in the lake a tiny bit. So for my shrubbery and my rock area, I'm just needing to wet my, my colors a little bit more. My favorite technique, getting this mountainside in, um, and a little bit over here. These big brushes are wonderful for picking up a lot of of paint and you can see where as long as I keep my palette really wet and juicy I don't have to dig in there and fill my brush. A simple touch with with the tip of the brush will give me um, a beautiful load on the brush. And we'll put in a little bit more of the um, undersea green. And you can show some trees up in the background if you want something rising up a little more. And once I get my green in, another one of my favorite tricks is to ins oops, don't want that one. There's quinacridone gold and there's quinacridone deep gold. Um, they're both just equally as lovely. Uh, a lot of people use the deep gold for their for their skies and, and sunsets and things. So I've loaded my brush with a lot of water. I've picked up some of the quinacridone gold and I'm just going to lay it in. And it's going to give me some... This is where I love the blooms. 
um, and they're just, you can allow them to happen and they will be uh, a great advantage to your painting. You can go back to your um, paper towel. I'm going to reuse this one because it's got just a little bit of the blue which is already in what I'm doing. Be careful when you're doing this, if you pick up a towel that's got another color on it, um, you run the risk of adding some, an element to, to your work that you maybe don't want. And so I'm just going to use this now, instead of making clouds, I'm going to make some, some highlighted areas for the rocks and the shrubs. So this top area will be more of the shrubs. And as, as I've shown before, to make a rock area, a piece of plastic. Uh, someone asked me, they weren't from uh, my part of the world where we, where we simply just call these bread tabs. They're little um, pieces of plastic that hold the end of a plastic bag together when you have a bag of bread or oranges or, or something. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of another term for them, um, but they're basically bag enclosures, plastic bag enclosures, and they're just little tabs. Some of them come with um, little nubs on them. I don't know if you can see, there's a little nub. I just use, um, I use my little X-Acto knife and I can very gently, because you don't want to alter the, the level of, of the end of the, of the piece of plastic. I cut that off and then I will just use a little sanding block and make sure that it's nice and flat on the end. And then I'm good to go to make make rock shapes. And when your paint on your page is still thick and rich and, and wet, you can move that pigment around and make shapes. So very effective for, for, for making rocks. Use your imagination. Keep them um, Keep them random and organic, and then we'll put we'll put a few more rocks maybe on this side. I think I would just like to have a bit more of the yellow in there. tiny bit so that it comes up more level with the trees. <clears throat> a bit more of a rocky, rocky surface. The paint will continue to, to mellow and diffuse as you go along and allow some of the um, edges to just sit with the darker colors and shading on them. Okay. battered a little bit on my uh, on my surface here. A damp paper towel often is adequate to take out those those lines. If it's not, then we can add a bit more color and uh, try to smooth that off a little bit. can use your paper towel as a great tool. See, I've got some wet paint happening there. Oops. So all of these colors that are kind of appearing because I'm pulling them out from the edges can be used in the, uh, in the texture of the lake as we go along. I need a bit more texture now. This is the solo brush. Again, I'm not, I'm not too concerned that the end of my brush is not flattened and even, because that gives me this beautiful textured bit for the shrubbery that I'm putting in. And so just a straight dab down 
on my surface of my palette with the color. And that just allows me to bring in. And then we can add our trees and um, bits of shrubbery as we go. All right, so we are pretty much uh, ready to go with our trees. Now that we've got this basis uh, underpinning done. Now we've mentioned before that um, you have to be very cautious when you're removing your tape. And I see I've got lots of water on some of the tape. I'm just going to try to dab a tiny bit of that off so that it doesn't uh, doesn't want to pull the paper up with it. And I don't mind dabbing a little bit um, in the background. You can see where, where I have dabbed, it allows um, that lifting of pigment that gives you that lightness that, that shows a bit of shadow and light play in your work. All right. All right. So when we lift our masking tape from our paint surface, page paint paper surface rather, um, gentle, gentle and slow. The softer the paper, the more uh, the glue from your tape is going to sort of attach itself to the paper. Um, there are some beautiful papers out there. Fluid 100 makes a gorgeous soft paper. It almost feels like velvet when you're painting on it, but it will um, not tolerate the masking tape as well uh, doing that. All right. When I remove the masking tape, I'm very conscious that my page is still, you can see it's, it's still a bit buckled. If I leave this on this, um, it's actually on a block, but I just taped it down to keep it secure on my, on my surface. Um, if I leave this till it's completely dry, it will flatten out on its own. And if it doesn't, if there are some areas, uh, if you've used an excess amount of water, you can, uh, you can use an iron just to simply um, flatten your page. So the trick to the tape is keep, keep your hand very close to your page without rubbing in through your wet paint and pull to an angle as close to the surface as you can. And you can see here where, where the tape wasn't secured so much on the edge that's going to add to the texture of the bark on my trees. Oftentimes, I will, if I'm running a long tree, I will let the tape sort of hang over the top edge so that it's loose and ready for me to pick up. But you can see how, how easily this tape comes away, even though the paper is wet. This, by the way, is Arsh. 140 pound, 300 GSM, rough, my favorite kind of paper to use. For most applications, there are, there are differences, and uh, as you continue your watercolor journey, you'll learn to, uh, to see those differences if you, if you experiment and try with other, um, other brands of paper. I've talked before about the quality of paper. 100% cotton is ideally the best. There are lots of other papers out there. Um, Machine-made, mold-made cellulose papers, Canson and Strathmore and lots of student grade um, offers out there for you. Um, and they're great for, for things where, um, where you're working maybe on smaller pieces. Um, you'll just find that your paints we perform much better with 100% cotton. There's different absorption, um, and once you get to to use them on a regular basis, you'll be able to really develop a, a consistent and solid reputation, uh, or not reputation, um, relationship with those paints and that um, and that paper. Sometimes it's hard to tell if that's paint or if that's, um, I think that's paint on there. Oh, no, that's a piece of tape. All right, I forgot I put that little piece in there. 
And, uh, all right. So flat as you can to the surface. Pull it low and slow. And you shouldn't have any of your paper coming up with your tape. Nothing worse than getting to this point and, and finding out that you've got uh, half of your paper lifting off. Because the pigments will react much differently if you've taken the surface off your paper. Okay. So our palette is still wet and lovely and ready to go. I'm going to go in with my plastic tab. And I very often like to start with a, with kind of a gray or the same blue that I've used in, in my, um, in the rest of the painting. I just like to start at one side. If you start here and work this way, you're going to run your hand through your wet paint. So it's just touching your, your pigment, touching the edge of the page, or the page, uh, edge of the trees on the page. And just here and there, picking up a little bit of an edge so that it looks like the bark is conforming around the tree. A little bit of color. You can go back in later and, and shade the, um, the creases and the, and the or, crooks of the uh, branches and things. But just to get things going, I like to just give um, a little bit um, and here, you know, if you happen to go a little bit over the edge, that's fine, because that, that just adds to the interest of the tree. When I'm doing this, I'm giving a touch to the edge, gentle pressure, and then I'm kind of giving a bit of a curve. And that will give your tree even more dimension. It helps if you kind of um, use a different part of the plastic as well, um, using one end or another or in the middle. You can also run it along and that sort of extends your, your branch. And this is, this is something you can use um, once you get the basis of your tree trunks down and you decide that you would like, you know, maybe another branch coming up there. You can just add a, a small line and that indicates a branch. Where I've been, um, for example, here where it, it kind of bumped out, I probably would add another branch coming out from that bump. It just sort of lends itself to the right, right spot for that to happen, right? And where the branch is attached to the tree, I sometimes will come in a tiny bit into the tree. That will give you uh, the dimension that you need there. You can also just take this and run it down a length of the of the branch or the of the bark of the tree, and that's a nice thing to do. I don't want to do too much of that on the inside of the tree um, because this is where the light is is happening, right? The dark side of the tree will be on e either side, so we're going to keep that in mind as we're going over here, and and we'll keep just a little bit of this happening on. Um, on this side of the tree just for a bit of definition. And a little dab in the color. And down at the bottom I can I can allow a little bit more uh, texture into the bark of the tree because it's it's going to be lower, it's going to be in more shadow. Okay. So now I've got my trees basically um, 
cover it on that one side with the color that I want to use. Oops, more tape. Again, because I'm impatient and I don't have time to let it dry, I'm just going to turn this around and we're going to work on the other side. Try to keep things um, a little bit on the random side. If you, if you have both sides coming across equally and joining together in the middle, you're just going to get a, a striped tree. So we want to keep in mind that nature's, um, as much as it can be beautiful and uniform, it's also kind of random when things uh, appear. So let's, let's keep that uh, keep that in mind. So this, this is the dark side of these trees. So I'm going to add a, just a little bit more happening here. More of the dark color. And I'll bring some more from the bottom up. And you can turn this little tab over and, uh, and keep using the colors that are left on it. When I'm doing this, I'm essentially laying it so that the, the tip hits flat on the paper and then I'm laying the piece of plastic over just slightly before I pull it across. And again, a very light touch is all that's required. We can go back in later with a brush uh, and, and pull the colors, blend them if we want. And again, I just want to make this. So this is Payne's Gray that I'm using here. And there's a little hair. That's one thing about the hockey brushes uh, is that they will lose a lot of hairs. And it just seems to be inherent with the product. I don't know how we can avoid that. And because this is the light side of the tree up here, I'm not going to want to do a whole lot of this color. Just enough to give a sense of the edge of those of those trunks. A little bit thicker at the bottom. And a little bit up at the top. And now the real fun begins. Because you get to decide what color you want the highlights of your birches to be. And they can be just as crazy as, um, as you want. Now, because I've smudged a little bit here, I'm going to go back in with this little brush with a bit of the um, undersea green. And I'm just going to make that into a happy little tree there, right? To quote Bob Ross, a well-known oil painter. I wonder if he ever tried watercolor. Interesting to know. I'll bet he loved it if he did. <laughs> okay. And just a touch of the blue. that we 
kind of messed up on there. If you've been following me along, you know, of course, that some of my favorite colors are uh, quinacridone gold, Mayan dark blue, undersea green, and moon glow. Now, moon glow is a fugitive color, which means it can fade over time. It's also a very granulating color, and it's made up of um, uh, blues and pinks and gorgeous pigments that, that, that create um, the purpley, mellow, beautiful tones that show up. That little dot's not going to go, so maybe we'll cover that up later with some, some leaves. Okay. So because I do love the moon glow, I'm going to just clean off some of this in the middle here first so it doesn't run together. One thing I should also mention, good thing to have a, a scrap piece of paper on hand if you're testing colors and you wanted to, you know, figure out what's going to work, have a little piece of paper beside you. And it doesn't have to be some of your expensive paper. Here's where your, um, where your beautiful um, offcuts of your cheaper paper will really work well. So there's my moon glow. There's my Mayan blue. There is my undersea green. These are very, very dark colors. But you will see if we test them out in a bit how they will work together. And if I put the quinacridone gold alongside them and even mixed in with them, you can see how gorgeous they kind of blend and, and run their textures together. We can also take a brush at some point and uh, feather the colors together even more. Just a damp brush. And you can see here where the, where the green and the gold are, are just coming together really beautifully. You can see where there's the purple and the gold and, and when they come together they give you this gorgeous soft purpley gray color that uh, you know, for, for the parts of the bark of a tree could be quite lovely. And there's some of the, the Mayan dark blue with the, with the gold. So try them out. Test. See what's going to, going to appeal to you. Um, so I'm going to go back to my plastic tab for now. And I think I'm going to do a bit of the, um, the moon glow. And again, it doesn't take much. And I, I want my paints wet, but not dripping. So we'll try with a little bit of, and we'll just sort of run that in between, a little bit over top of some of the other colors, because the blending of them is so beautiful. And we can... Um, enhance the darker side of, of these trees. This is the lighter side of these, so I'm going to stay fairly light on, on this side, not do a lot of the darker color if I can help it. And just a hint, because if we go back in with a brush at some point, um, that little tiny bit of color can be spread out into, um, into making some beautiful effects. 
and I like to have a little more down on the bottom as I said so there we have okay just to show you the effect I'm going to give you just an example of how the quinacridone gold, and if you if you lay it in fairly thick in some spots, that gold is spectacular, and it can give you a really gorgeous uh, pop of color. And the birches are going to be the star of the show, right? So why not dress them up? Let them shine. nice nice highlight on the inside sunny side of these trees the trees are so um, so forgiving and you can have fun with these um, I mean really you could leave them like this and they would be just lovely and gorgeous And we'll just give this a turn around this way, just so we can get a bit of gold on the back side of those trees. Even though there's no sun back there, we sort of want that color to just bring them all together. And a little bit on this guy. Again. Don't be too worried if you come, come out a tiny bit. We'll cover that up in another layer. And I think that's probably enough for now. So in order to get these trees even with turning and I'm always getting my my fingers into the uh, into the color and smushing it around so we want to try to be a little more careful with that okay I'll turn it back The brush that I find most effective for um, for working the rest of the trees now that we've set our, our uh, bread type bread tab plastic tab aside is um, really an acrylic brush so it's a nice flat surface on the end it comes to a nice chiseled tip so it gives me that ability to be a little more precise and we're going to work with a damp brush Somehow I have blue, blue paint everywhere here. Um, and like I say, you can you could leave it like this. You could go in and define your trees more. While those trees are, are just drying a tiny bit, I think I'm going to go in and show you again how you can uh, define some shorelines. So this is a damp brush, very chisel tip. And I've decided that this little blue patch back here is going to be the basis of a mountain. And so we can put our horizon across here, which is a little closer to center than I would normally do, but that's okay. Just give an indication of where this beautiful lake ends. Feather that down into your bottom color.
horizon lines are hard to keep straight so that's one of the things that you have to really sometimes I'll even get a ruler out just to make sure that 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 one line portion is straight once you're at a mountain area you can jig jig and jog that around and you're you're okay to do that but once you're open once you're in open territory you need to keep that as straight as you can And then once I've got that in there, I can go back later on and, and define those um, shoreline areas, deepen those up a tiny bit. Okay. So now that my color on my trees has had a chance to, uh, to settle in and dry a bit more, I can go in with my brush and start this process of just sort of Pulling the color into the tree a little bit, just so that you, I mean white is important in, in watercolor, but you don't always want so much stark white, so uh, in order to, uh, to keep things a little softer, now that you've got these beautiful chunks of color all along the side, you can work to feather that through. And you can see how, how quickly that becomes a gorgeous uh, bit of bark on those trees. Pulling that dark right through into the... Um, so we'll work on this side and again once I'm through with pulling the uh, the shadow side of the trees across the, the uh, branches and the trunks then we can flip it around and, and uh, work from the other side and, and pull them across as well. I just, it never ceases to amaze me how gorgeous these colors come together. And like I say, you can use whatever colors you like. They're your trees, and uh, as long as you keep similar colors to what you've got in your background, um, because the only different thing I've added here is a little bit of that, uh, of that um, moon glow. If I wanted to, I could even I could even go in and oh, well, let's see what would happen if we went in and added a little bit of the quinacridone rose. Where should we put some of that? I'm going to try that right there. See how that's going to work. Yes, look how gorgeous that is. Let's put a bit more up here just to continue the theme and yeah. so as I say, nature has wonderful surprises in store for us if we if we take a look at um, what we have around us. I'm just going to touch my brush into the quinacridone rose very lightly and just see if I can bring that into some other small spaces here. Yeah, I like the rose. And so I've kept that same that same color theme as, as I have throughout the entire um, the entire uh, piece. So essentially, once my trees are done, I could leave this. It could be a I'd be happy with that as a completed painting. Um, I likely would go in and do a little more enhancing on the um, on the shoreline in the background. But oftentimes I wouldn't even have to do that if I decide to put if I decide to put um, foliage leaves on my trees, then I can cover up a lot of that and leave a lot of it to the imagination. So again, just. Just keeping a little bit of white on your trees. I'm just going to turn this one around so I can show you 
how that comes together on the other side of that tree. So remember, this is the light side of your tree. So you're not going to want to pull too much of the, of the dark through. A little bit, little bit down here because it's the base of the tree, I can certainly do that. But I'm going to want to focus more on the goldy parts of the tree, I think. And just a light touch. Some places I can bring it all the way across. Other places I will leave the white. And in some places I will just leave a tiny bit of the texture from the from the plastic tab. And that is um, basically how you want to finish these trees. I mean, you could fiddle for hours with them, right? But I kind of, um, I kind of like that appearance, the, the white showing through the bark. Um, and like, if I wanted to put, um, well, let's go in with our, with our solo liner and uh, touch in our Mayan dark blue. That would be a nice thing to indicate with a little, um, little branch. Branches are kind of random. And then up here we started one with the bread tie. Well, let's continue it this way. Just nice and light. Some of them are bent over. see. I'm going to turn it back around <laughs> just because it's... I have painted pictures completely upside down, but I think today I want to see what I'm doing as far as the... branches go. Give them kind of a A random pattern. And they, I mean, these gorgeous birches have all these squiggly, wiggly branches that just kind of come out of nowhere sometimes. And then we had a few places where our tree kind of got some bumps on it from our, our bread, our plastic tab. So we'll just add a few, few little pieces that come off of there. And that's pretty much how, oh, no, I dabbed a, a blob of paint on there. So have some fun with your branches. Put them in wherever wherever you think you can, wherever you want to. There's a little bend in the tree, maybe another one comes out of there somehow. Okay. Just make that blob into a bit of a branch. <laughs> okay. So it's entirely up to you to decide when you want to stop with your trees. You could play with them for hours. You can come back to them uh, another day and uh, 
just with a damp brush you can you can re-wet it might take a bit longer to get the paints to move a little bit but be patient just a bit of water on your brush so dip the water in your or paint in your brush in your water and pull it out give it a dab on a paper towel and uh, go from there See where we can put a bit of that pink in this side. Yeah, I like that. I like that pink in there. It uh, makes a little statement. Now this tree, I'm, after all that talk about it being the light side, I see I've made it a bit darker than I think it should be, so I'm just going to wet that, and then I'm going to go in with a clean paper towel, so I don't add any extra color, and I'm just going to press and pull away some of that pigment. You can see if some of it's come up. Just add a bit of water. And pull up some pigment that makes it a bit lighter and down in here too we seem to have some kind of a some kind of an issue going on and we'll just pull that out a bit this is called lifting most colors will lift nicely some are more staining than others and uh, will be more difficult you'll find that often your your reds and your golds can be a challenge to lift but it's amazing how some of some of the darkest colors even can lift out and sometimes the lifting can give you a beautiful um, a beautiful extra bit of texture that you weren't expecting as we did down here when we lifted out a little bit uh, in the shrubbery And then we'll just maybe add a, a bit of the gold in there to help lighten things up. And if I was to uh, wet that gold even more, and then do another lift. Now some people will go in with um, with gouache, which is an opaque watercolor, basically, and and add if they feel that they've missed out on some spots. I don't mind that you know we have the odd little imperfection. Like I said, nature is is perfectly imperfect, and uh, I don't think we have to worry if we have a a bit of. Um, things going a little awry. Okay. So there are your birch trees. Have some fun with them. Create some backdrop if you feel like it. When I'm putting some land lines in the back, some horizon lines, I'm, I, I like to keep them kind of jagged and uneven. It gives that, uh, gives that a sense of depth perspective. Okay. And that may not be straight. I don't have a, 
and I, like I say, I very often will pull out a ruler just to make sure that I keep my horizon lines straight. This is a wider brush. You can often go in with a, a smaller. See the difference there? If I've got a tinier area that I want to work on, just to make that uh, bit of a horizon. And I'm just adding a tiny bit of color to that just so that it shows that there is a line back there. And you can pull them down, bring them down. Okay. Now, if you wanted to add some foliage that we talked about earlier, just to cover up some of the drips, um, I don't even know where I got this brush. I think it's a stencil brush. Yeah, it doesn't really say on it, but it's got a nice sort of textured end to it. So I will use this often to make leaves. I will use my hake or hake brush because I can spread it out. It's got a nice bit of, uh, of an area at the end that you can use. And um, you can touch two different colors. So I'll touch maybe a light gold and an Aussie red gold. And then I'll just sort of start making a little canopy. Remember branches tend to often lean forward. And so I'm just going to make that, make that end a little fluffy again. And we'll just make some canopy of color happening here. This is the gold. This will be the highlight on your leaves. So this will be um, the tops for the most part of, of each bow. And you don't have to be very um, prolific with your with your um, color either. It can be very light, airy. What you'll find also is that once you once you start having fun putting these these gorgeous um, leaf leaf shapes in, little canopies, here I will probably go in afterwards with my brush and, and try to extend a branch in behind there that looks like it's coming out to support these leaves that are forming here. So when I when I put these in, I try to keep in mind a, sort of a balance in the page. Okay, so I want my trees to be uh, nice and, and uh, even looking, balanced a little bit. Thanks so much for joining me today, accomplices. Uh, if you like what you've seen, subscribe artist Linda Norman, or visit my website, bandrystudio.com. That's B-A-N-D-R-A-O-I, studio.com. <laughs>